old city and you could hear clap, 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 clap. so uh clearly things are turbulent in jerusalem as they were a thousand years ago and as they probably will be in a thousand years time um yes. let's kick off this morning's daily energy markets forum tuesday may 11th the day before eid or close to the 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 muslim holiday at the end of Ramadan, uh, and, and best wishes to everybody that's uh, celebrating those holidays, and much of the Middle East already closed for that holiday. Let's kick off this morning with Vandana Harry, sitting in Singapore, founder and CEO of Vanda Insights. Uh, good morning, Vandana. I see from your Vanda Insights uh, views letter, uh, obviously pointing out that the promise of summer oil demand boom is a little bit uncertain. How do you see the markets at the moment opening in Asia a little bit down this morning? Yeah, um, thanks, uh, Sean, and, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, let's uh, very quickly start off with uh, the very immediate term, what's happening in the markets. Um, we do see a sell-off uh, since this morning in Asia. Um, it's mainly because of the colonial uh, pipeline. Uh, well, colonial pipeline caused quite a bit of turbulence in the in the markets yesterday because that was the first trading opportunity uh, after finding out uh, that uh, the pipeline had to be shut. Now it's a massive artery, two and a half million barrels per day, supplies nearly forty five percent of the entire U.S. Northeast and East Coast states. Um, what happened, however, um, came out through yesterday uh, was a bit of a relief uh, for the market. So uh, some of the spur lines of uh, that main artery are still open. So, uh, you know, the, some of the endpoints are still being supplied. Um, and uh, my understanding is that the terminals along the way okay, you typically carry 10 to 15 days of stock. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't that worst case scenario. And uh, the, the, the Colonial Pipeline operator has said that it is working towards getting 100% resumption of operations by the end of this week. So, um, you know, a, a bit of, there was a bit of excitement. Uh, I, I think some um, tankers were put on subs uh, in Europe that, you know, potentially to send a product to the US, but it seems like for now, the situation might, uh, you know, not spiral out of control. So we see a little bit of a sell-off, but having said that, I think the markets remain extremely volatile. Uh, I think attention is now back once, you know, with the colonial pipeline a little bit uh, retreated. Uh, attention is back on oil demand, COVID, and how the world looks in terms of countries getting out of it and countries still dealing with it. Yes, indeed. Uh, and, uh, and there's many of those. Uh, let's kick off to Sydney with Peter McGuire, CEO of XM Australia. Peter, the outlook from China, despite these disruptions in the U.S., remains quite robust. Uh, we saw uh, data coming out overnight from what the the sort of elevated prices, what they call the factory gate data, which shows yeah. prices rising quite heavily in export-oriented China. Uh, things still racing along in China. Absolutely, Sean. And you know, from a demand side. Uh, very, very strong numbers. We experienced that 225 a tonne for out of Singapore yesterday for iron ore. So all time high, you've got copper very, very strongly bid up at you know ten and a half thousand a metric tonne. It's up the best part of 20% or 22% in the last month and a bit. So it's taken a lot of the other base metals up with it. So yeah, inflation certainly a concern and how that runs out maybe third or fourth quarter. But at the moment, that strong demand coming from China, the global appetite for raw commodities and infrastructure and rebuild is very much, I think, uh, going to you know, send us into a fairly strong move to the upside and continued strengthening across many of those base metals and uh, other commodities. Lori Hatayan, MENA Director of the Natural Resource Governance Institute, sitting in Beirut, one of my favorite cities in the world, despite all of the dramas that are inevitably always around that great city, as they were a thousand years ago, and as they will be in a thousand years' time. 
Uh, Laurie, uh, the const continuous uh, negotiations between Iran and the U.S. And, and of course, not only the U.S., but the permanent five members of the United Nations Security Council in Vienna still trying to hammer out a deal and signaling slowly but surely that something could happen this month. Uh, well, I think that we're, we're hearing like uh, different uh, views from that uh, meeting. Sometimes we're hearing people really being excited, saying that we're very close, and sometimes hearing others saying that uh, we're discussing there are improvements, but we're not uh, uh, there yet. I think it's good to continue the discussions. Uh, and I, I believe that these discussions will continue, even though they're putting on themselves all of them pressures, giving like saying that this month should be the last rounds and we should end before the elections or after the elections. So all of that, it's like different, uh, different tactics, if you want, of putting pressure uh, to fasten the, 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 uh, and to uh, the discussions. I guess the but discussions the, the will basic, continue, but the I important... Mean, yeah. yeah I, I was just going to say the basic assumption being if you're going into a fourth round, fourth week of discussions, things must be moving in a certain direction. Uh, definitely, definitely. And I think like all on all fronts, there is this intention and willing to come up with a solution and to come up with an agreement. The timing now is this that tactical issue. When will that come? And for, for the oil and gas sector, I guess we're all waiting to see like any signs of uh, removing the sanctions on the uh, on oil and gas, because that will mean uh, that will mean that you will see more of the Iranian oil coming back legally to the market and what implications that will have on the oil market. So we're, I think that that is that is something that will come, but I think it will not come uh, soon. That will be maybe at a later stage because uh, now removing the oil and oil sanctions, if you want, it means like. Uh, the, the Americans are giving in very easily and they don't want that. They want to show that, uh, that they are tough and equal in these the negotiations, even though that they were the ones that withdrew from the, uh, from the agreement. So I think that will come at one point, but not very soon. Vandana, again, I enjoyed reading in your Vanda Insights newsletter uh, the, the, the sort of outbreak of COVID across Asia, the challenge not only in India, but also in Japan, uh, which is gripped by a fourth wave of COVID uh, infections since April, as noted in your newsletter. I mean, these are adding up. We're now even talking about the possibility that the Olympics will once again be postponed or possibly even canceled. Your outlook for uh, Asia dealing with this wave of COVID, particularly, of course, India. Yeah, it's quite concerning. And uh, I, I made it a point to especially focus on that. And of course, it's not South, just Southeast Asia, as we know. Uh, we've been in the previous weeks discussing about uh, how it's continuing to fester in places as diverse and far apart as Canada, Brazil, and, and Japan as well. But I think, to my mind, the Southeast Asian case is particularly worrying. And of course, the oil market tends to neglect that. The oil market is very, very fixated on what's in, on the, the accelerated reopening in the US and the summer reopening in, in Europe. But what's happening in some of these uh, Southeast Asian countries, you know, you have uh, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, they are seeing unprecedented spikes. So, you know, I'd take a look at the graphs I have in, in that report. It's, uh, you know, like a little wave, a little wave, you know, it's, they are, but the third or fourth wave, I don't know if you can call it a wave, it's a spike. It's like, you know, going up at 45 degrees. Now, of course, none of these countries in terms of intensity or the total number of cases or even hospitalizations and deaths are anywhere comparable to India. But within that, you know, against the population size, it's extremely worrying. Uh, I mean, here in Singapore is another example. We had, you know, months of relative calm. And uh, you know, just the past couple of weeks, uh, they detected all of, you know, 10 clusters, different clusters are uh, starting around quite worryingly again, a hospital here in the heart of the city. So, um, you know, Singapore has had to roll back some of the phase three reopening, which was done in December. So my point here is that these, um, and we had the WHO yesterday uh, calling, labeling the Indian, now it's called a, a triple mutant, a mutant, a variant of concern, uh, as in it, it remains a global health risk. So my point here is that um, 
yes, you know, we may still have that summer demand boom fueled by, you know, the, the U.S. reopening activity, uh, European countries reopening their borders to, to visitors. But there's a huge risk here. And, you know, personally, of course, we all want to be optimistic and, and positive. But, you know, with our analyst hat on, we need to keep this in mind. There's a huge risk here. Not, neither U.S. population is about 35 percent vaccinated. European countries are nowhere near that. Uh, there's a huge risk here that uh, with that sort of crowds and, you know, that are typical of summer holidays and intermingling uh, these variants, which are already, the Indian variant alone is found, has been already found in at least 20 countries around the world. What, you know, God forbid, but what if we have another wave? So my question is that, okay, a summer demand boom, but is it going to be sustainable? And I think that's completely up in the air at this point. Peter, uh, the inevitable uh, areas of concern that Vandana points out there uh, 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 while analyzing the overarching picture, the macro picture. But meanwhile, on the trading end, hedge funds are pouring back into oil. Uh, they've boosted their position for the fourth week in a row, buying up to uh, 100 million barrels over the last four weeks. Uh, there's a lot of confidence in the momentum of the oil market on the long position. Absolutely, Sean. And, you know, where we are from, uh, as, the, as the driving season starts to engage, possibly we see a Brent, you know, 72, 73. There was a, a fair bit of heat, you know, earlier uh, well, in the last matter of days as far as the pipeline. But if you're looking at the big scheme of things, yes, US dollar continues to soften. Um, global demand is increasing. So all of that is... I think a, a nice wind in the sails for producers. And, you know, you could see a WTI 70, oh, pardon me, a, a 67, 68 sometime in June. So I think that that momentum, more of the hedge funds will enter and uh, they'll start to stack even larger positions, I'd say, from, a, you know, a speculative side, Sean. And we've got 80% of the positions, the open interest is on the long side. What does that yeah, tell you bet. about the structure of the market going forward? For uh, you know that dis you know, that very unbalanced uh, long position versus short. Well, it, it tells you another side that you can also, if, if things go the other way, you can get short squeezes, and you know, and all of a sudden it can ratchet down a matter of dollars very, very quickly. So that's the issue at hand. Uh, if you get a you get a strong move to the upside as far as, and we don't know what happens in the future, but U.S. dollar goes back to ninety three or ninety four or something else happens from a geopolitical concern and, you know, the unknown with the likes of Iran and Israel. So all of those parts need to be also considered on the geopolitical front and, more importantly, what that does to traders and their appetite to be continue to be long. Laurie, uh, we had a, a feature interview last week uh, uh, with the CEO of uh, Cyprus Hydrocarbons Company and... Basically, the sentiment there was that the development of the East Med <coughs> is in a very, very difficult place. He doesn't expect the majors to come back. Uh, uh, he was quite critical of Lebanon's position, uh, and that seems very unlikely that Lebanon will break, uh, drill anything anytime soon. Your thoughts uh, coming out of the COVID sort of pandemic period, can the East Med get back up? Uh, look, uh, the Ismet was never standing tall. To <laughs> right, to come exactly. Back. <laughs> exactly. So we had a lot of challenges, and it says it, um, uh, challenges related to the markets, and challenges related to infrastructure, and challenges related to geopolitics. So we had this triple challenges in the region, and now you add to it COVID and a lot of companies freezing their development projects, especially in, in Cyprus. And in Lebanon, we've never taken off. You know, we were so, uh, Total was supposed to drill another uh, well in block uh, four, nine, but uh, everything has been postponed for different reasons and mainly for uh, COVID reasons. Uh, but I think one, uh, one good, uh, if you want, uh, um, um, a sign was that uh, that uh, MOU between Mubadala and Delek, the Israeli uh, uh, company that uh, that holds like 30 percent or something at the uh, uh, at the Tamar uh, at the Tamar field in Israel. So I think that could that is a sign of possible uh, investments. Exactly the uh, the Mubadala investment in Israel. So that is a sign of where things uh, could go. 
uh, in the region and new players coming in in the region besides the big ones that we already have new players being interested in the region there are a lot of challenges and uh, i well, know these, Charles these might be players critical. these players might be where the 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 investment will come rather than seeing the likes of exxon or others returning the the the, the majors the international majors may be seeking easier or better spend and return in other geographies. De definitely, definitely. As I said, like we have market challenges, we have infrastructure challenges added to ge uh, geopolitical challenges. So not everybody would want to, uh, to take that risk and looking into the future where the future of the sector is going uh, with all the uh, challenges ahead for the short term or medium term and the long term with energy transition, etc. And where the market for the gas of the region will be. So if Asia is a growing market, how can the East Med Ismat gas being transported to uh, to the Asian market. How will that cost? Are they going to be competitive? Again, all of these questions are on the table. But definitely, there are good uh, positive signs. But I don't see uh, like uh, any any like if you want breakthrough in in the coming uh, at least for the coming years. Like uh, it's certainly two a or good three years. It's, it's certainly a good reference a benchmark for the appetite coming out of COVID for risk capital to go into what is relatively risky exploration and development, very expensive. Uh, the med is, is, is deep water uh, and the uncertainty of the market for That's the gas makes it a profile that uh, in this climate coming out of COVID with major companies being uh, very sensitive about where they deploy their capex, it will be one to watch. Uh, Vandana, the big question going forward into the summer, you mentioned it a few times in your earlier statement, will we get jet fuel back? Will jet fuel demand recover? We're getting, uh, we've got a report on our digest today that while we might see a lot more planes in the air, they're going to be traveling short distances. And so jet fuel consumption will not have the uplift that was originally forecast this summer. Yeah, I think that's almost a foregone conclusion, uh, Sean. Once again, uh, you know, the oil market is very focused on uh, the mobility, various mobility data in the U.S. And uh, sometimes we almost, perhaps it's a, a human need to be optimistic that we almost forget that there's the rest of the world which is showing a very, very different picture. So, yes, you know, uh, in inter-regional uh, uh, travel in, in Europe is expected in, in summer. A national travel in the US is already picking up, uh, both air travel, road travel, we know that. So it's all of it that is, is definitely positive for uh, jet fuel demand in the US, uh, for, but more so as the EIA has also articulated several times, uh, more so for gasoline demand, and we know gas oil distillate uh, demand has already been, uh, you know, picking, has already gone uh, to pre-COVID levels in the U.S. because of all the movement uh, of the goods. But you know, if you take a few steps back and you look at the global picture, um, you know, again, you know, as we were just uh, chatting before starting the show, uh, Singapore, you know, for months it has had relative calm. It has there's been relative calm in in uh, this region as well. You know. Southeast Asia currently accepted. Uh, and yet the only country that Singapore has, has uh, thought about starting a travel bubble with uh, is Hong Kong. And that's been off again, on again. And it looks like it may be canceled again because of the out latest outbreak in Singapore. There's a travel bubble between uh, Australia and New Zealand, but I don't know if Peter might be able to tell us how, uh, to what extent people are actually uh, using that. So if you look at this entire region, of course, places like China and India is where you will see uh, a big uh, jet consumption being for domestic travel, but for the there, rest, there of might people... be there might be some hope in the fact that the UK opened up a travel bubble with the Falkland Islands, which of course is quite a distance from uh, from the UK. So uh, perhaps that will burn some fuel for the three people that take up that opportunity. Uh, Peter, looking into the outlook in, in, in China, the, the, we're seeing, as, as mentioned by Vandana, a lot of attention taken by the resurgent American economy. But China outlook will probably still be the engine for OPEC Plus as they make their decisions over the coming months. No doubt, Sean, and you know, they're, they're, they're 
the country is absolutely booming from a demand side for all base metals, as I mentioned earlier, and of course, energy. So that will only grow as each month wears on. I, I've spoken, we've got some Chinese nationals that I buy the Financial Times from each Sunday, and I, they talk to their family members in Shanghai, and they tell me that things are very, very good over there and all across pretty much all of China. So there's no downturn or, or negativity. Their families are doing quite well commercially. Uh, the, the local economies over there and, you know, the man on the street, the woman on the street are performing very, very well. So that tells me that there's a, a very strong confidence level across all of China. And uh, hopefully we all get that very much washing across the rest of Asia and into India and the rest of the world. But the Chinese won't be traveling too far outside of China, I would say. They became a major not. major source of tourism for here in Dubai and many parts of Europe. Sure. Uh, but uh, they will not be on the road this year, I would suspect. I would think you're right, Sean. Uh, let's look at the survey question, Peter. You mentioned it earlier that you thought there could be some momentum to lift oil prices above $70. It's sort of the big question. There's been many reasons why it's gone knocking on 70, but it hasn't closed above $70 a barrel for two years. Um, not just COVID time, but the year before COVID, it struggled to get there. And the big question is, we're range bound in the 60s. When will this next happen? Uh, sometime this month, in May, next month in June, as the summer driving season really bites and we start to um, get some very tangible demand, sometime in quarter three or not until 2022. Uh, has it happened for two years? When will it happen next? Place your bets on the spinning wheel. I don't know which one I want myself, actually, but uh, I think I'm going to go with the middle one it just it seems to be the the, the one that, that we never we never quite get to uh lori what's happening in libya we saw the uh oil production there kick back a bit there there was a period that it um it, the the it dropped due to some disputes around the money now the money came it seems like we've got back up to where we were at 1.3 million barrels does Libya feel still vulnerable to these internal dynamics? Uh, I guess it will. It will continue this uh, tension between the NOC and the central bank. Uh, we will continue to see that. We'll continue to see a bit of uh, political uh, tensions, but I, we don't see anything critical happening for the coming few months, at least. Let's say a few months, not uh, until the end of the year, because we are... Uh, watching what's happening there and every time there is a new uh, crisis because as you know they are supposed to by the end of the year have elections uh, so we're watching uh, what would happen on the way and what the political crisis will come up and what could could uh, what effects could it have on the oil and gas sector but let's say we've seen over the last few months including Libya up and down but the the OPEC uh, production output has grown every month. It seems to be increasing uh, now on a steady, but incremental, but nonetheless growing all the time inside the agreement and outside. And most yeah. notably Iran, which is up to above two and a half million barrels a day, according to the latest reports. So, yeah, so uh, these are like things to watch, I guess, like Iran, uh, Libya developments, Iran, and uh, looking into the region, what's happening, there is a lot of dialogue going in the region, good, but at the same time, there are tensions at the Strait of Hormuz. So I think it is kind of volatile. It is at the stage where we don't know which direction are we going to take. Is it going to be like a dialogue and everybody uh, hugging, kissing, uh, loving each other, or it will take us to the other direction where we'll see apparently, like more apparently of the tension. Apparently, hugging will be allowed in the UK now. This is uh, headline news. Uh, by Boris Johnson. He's hugging. The Brits don't like to hug. I don't know what he's talking about, but nonetheless, they will be hugging around. Joke aside, Laurie, we saw overnight also reports of U.S. firing, U.S. vessels in the Persian Gulf firing at Iranian vessels. I suppose it reminds us of the vulnerability of the situation. Exactly. 
Exactly, exactly. And as we said, like, as we said, uh, 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 and a, couple, a couple of weeks ago, when I was on, on the show again, like, there will be two tracks, you will have the dialogue track at the same time, you'll have on the field, some of these tensions, calculated tensions, that will be kind of uh, putting pressure on the uh, on the table dialogue table. And I think this will continue. But I know that uh, we, from what we are seeing, like it, these are calculated tensions and no one wants to really uh, go beyond that. Uh, but as the Americans said, miscalculations happen sometimes and accidents happen sometimes or incidents that could escalate things. Uh, but the way it is going with all the different tables of dialogue that are going around the region, uh, we were like, there were like signs that things are moving uh, into the right direction. I don't know now how the Israeli-Palestinian situation will affect, uh, will, if, will have an effect on the different tables. This is something that definitely I'll be watching for the coming weeks. Vanda, I was taken also in your weekly newsletter about the, this, the piece you did on herd immunity is no longer the end game. It does look like in the US, they've kind of moved the goalposts a bit on that because of they're now the, the speed in which vaccinations are happening are starting to plateau and to slowly decline. Yeah, that, that certainly caught my attention. And uh, there's a very good piece in the New York Times last week uh, with some quotes from none other than um, Anthony Fauci, uh, who's saying that just forget about herd immunity and not forget about it for now, but but forever, uh, potentially in, in COVID. So we know that the US had a very remarkable upswing uptake of uh, vaccinations and in the first 100 days of Biden, uh, a lot of records were, were broken, but uh, it slowed down. And I think that's quite worrying. Um, people are, so basically it's the uh, after 35% coverage that they have reached, it's the vaccine doubters that are now being lured with anything from free cash to free beer to baseball tickets, but it's just the uptake is still very, very slow. So the new school of thought now is that, uh, so if you hark back to last year, you know, we all were discussing about how 60 to 70% is the, you know, conventional wisdom is that is the percentage of population that needs to be vaccinated in order to, re to reach herd immunity. Uh, a lot of experts of late have been saying that looking at the more contagious uh, variants, that could be now 80%. So what's happening in the US is, and including the likes of Fauci are, you know, sitting back and saying, just forget about it, it's not going to happen. So, you know, the US is not, if the US, which has such, had such remarkable success in immunization, is saying forget about herd immunity, uh, you know, just think about what, what's going to happen in the rest of the world. And well, what it's, about certainly, the it's certainly going to become a case where countries that are capable of managing breakouts and those that are not is going to be a very critical tool in the box. On that point, Van, and I just before we go, I wanted to get your outlook for India, of course, your home country. What will be the, the possibility of a national lockdown? It looks like Modi's coming under greater pressure uh, to try and break this out of control infection rate that's still in the numbers beyond anybody can count. Yeah, the pressure is coming from a lot of right-minded thinking individuals, organizations, and of course, there's a, a good element of political pressure involved in this as well. My personal feeling is that not having gone down that route until now, uh, I would be extremely surprised to see the, the central government doing a U-turn. Uh, but having said that, you know, I think it's for all effective purposes, India is... Uh, has imposed curbs because the majority of the states and union territories have curbs. Of course, they don't resemble anything as strict at la as last year's national lockdown, but they're very, very strict curbs. And as a result, uh, you know, I mentioned on your show earlier as well, I, I believe that I, I do think um, Indian oil demand will be down at least 20% through May. Another reason I voted for, yes, we will probably see Brent at 70. We will likely see it. Uh, but next month. I think May is a write-off. Um, you know, Indian demand is uh, is going to rem remain depressed by at least a million barrels per day, about 20%, at least through this month, I think. Okay, let's get the survey result and give Peter the last word. Uh, next month, June, getting 46% of this room, uh, followed by sometime in Q3. But uh, 
nothing happening in May, it would appear, Peter, uh, although we did get a forecast earlier in, in the week by Jorge Montague that it would be in the coming week. And then we got a forecast from our other commentator, Omar Najia, who said it would probably be in the third quarter. So I'll put you on the spot, Peter. What day next week will it happen? No. Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm with Omar, Sean, so I'm saying third quarter. But um, if it's going to happen next week, then it's going to be Thursday. There's no doubting that. Always on a Thursday, Sean. Sure. Always on a Thursday. Always does on it a have Thursday. To, does it, is it ultimately at this point we have to see tangible demand increase, i.e. the driving season? Uh, or uh, I mean, yeah. what's happened with the momentum play? Is it burnt out? We now need tangible demand? Well, we had a good move to the upside with that, you know, the shock as far as uh, the pipeline. So there's, you get three or four different things. First off, you had a very, very strong move to the downside US dollar over the last matter of days. You had um, poor or an underwhelming NFP number. But if you had a stronger non-farm payrolls number, then that may have supported the, the move to the upside a little bit more. Then you've it got Supported that equities, but not oil, obviously. Well, exactly. And, and then we've had the NASDAQ get hit with, you know, yeah, I'm having a look at Taiwan and Tokyo today. They've been spanked down three and three and a half, nearly 4% on some of those. So their equity markets are under being hammered. So if you get the rising tide and you get first off and you get a little bit, throw a little bit in there as far as, you know, some geopolitical tensions over a hot July or August in the Middle East, and that creates more deal tension there, then possibly you're going to hit that number, Sean. That's what I'm looking at, but you're not far away from it and it can happen very, very quickly. We've all been on these markets long enough to realise that a week's a long time in the commodity markets. I think it's also worth noting, and that's why I put it into the question uh, today, that it didn't happen for a year before COVID. Uh, and yeah. so the the sort of five-year average and all of those things... Uh, uh, although we are in exceptional times, there's no doubt about it. Listen, we wrap it up there for the week. Uh, Eid Mubarak, as they say to everybody celebrating the holidays, we'll take the rest of the week off back on Sunday. Vandana, thank you so much. Uh, Laurie, uh, best regards. Uh, and Peter, thank you for your insights today, as always. Really appreciate it. We'll catch up with everybody from next Sunday. All the best. Have a great few days. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks.